I'm talking today about steps you can take to make your work more reproducible. I'll focus on computational work. And by reproducible, I mean that the data and code are assembled in a way that you can hand them to someone else and they can rerun the code and get the same results, the same figures and tables. You know, I'll start with a personal story. I'm an applied statistician and really my greatest joy is helping people to make sense of their data. I have a lot of different scientific collaborators and I um, like to spend time looking at their data, doing analysis. I end up writing a lot of reports, you know, describing what I've done, what I've learned, um, what I think our next steps are. I just sent a report like that to a collaborator and he almost immediately wrote back, Carl, this is very interesting. However, you used an old version of the data, n equals 143 rather than n equals 226. I'm really sorry you did all that work with the incomplete data set. Ah, you get an email like this and you, um, you know, what happened? Why am I using the wrong data? Where's the right data? It, a bit of a panic. But what he didn't know was that at this point in my life, I had adopted a reproducible workflow such that you know, I spent 20 minutes looking for the, looking for the right data set, um, but then plug it into the spot, into the right spot in my pipeline, run a single command, and I could reproduce the report with the corrected data um, and you know, check it over to make sure that it's qualitatively correct. And basically a half an hour after I read this email, I was able to send him a corrected report. And that to me is, is you know, a, a reproducibility success story. You know, we're all gonna make mistakes. And the question is, can we re recover from them? How, how much work will it be to to clean up after the mistakes that we will inevitably make. Um, but a second really important lesson here is, is that when I write a report to a collaborator, I always start with a paragraph that is um, you know, describing the data, describing what I view our shared goals to be. And because I included that, that description in the first paragraph, it said, n equals 143, he was able to identify immediately that I was using the wrong, you know, an old version of the data. You know, if I hadn't included that kind of summary, we would not have known that I had made this mistake until probably much later. You know, my life is not always quite so rosy. You know, many times I, st I get emails from collaborators that are like, you know, the results in table one don't seem to correspond to what you have in figure two. Or um, at the end of a big project, we ask, you know, where did we get this data file? Like the kind of the key, uh, you know, a key list of um, control genes, say on a microarray that we just got from some guy at some point in the past. There's no um, real history to that um, key file. Or typical for me is, you know, I, in the midst of some late night bout of data diagnostics, I decide I'm going to omit a few samples. Um, and then a year or two years later, we come to finally write the paper and I'm thinking, I need to explain why I chose to omit those samples, but did I, did I record why? And, um, yeah, and sometimes I find myself having to go back and reanalyze, try to, you know, how are those samples different than the other samples that would have led me to have omit those particular samples. Or, you know, for my, for my lab scientist collaborators, they often are confronted with, you know, you know, at the, you know, years after a study going back into a uh, you know, a hard drive and trying to figure out which image went with which experiment that they did. Whereas for me, it's mostly like the morning after some late night bout of data analysis, I have this like absolutely awesome figure that my collaborator will love. And I show it to her and she's like, okay, that's cool, but what gene is this? And then I end up having to, you know, go and look through the logs and try to figure out how, you know, what exactly was the gene and how was it I made that figure. 
Or, you know, I come back to a project six months later where my collaborator is giving me some new data and I have to figure out, you know, what order do I run these scripts now to get the new data incorporated with the old one? Um, or, you know, a collaborator that's doing, you know, using some script I gave him on, on his own, he, you know, reports your script is now giving an error and I have to, you know, what was it that I, what, what was it that happened that caused that error? It was working perfectly fine a month ago, I'm sure. Or I had a student that was, um, he had a, a method that he wanted to compare to other people's methods. Um, he sent emails to various to various authors asking for you know code behind their their approach so he could use it to compare it to his approach. One of the emails we got back is you know the attached is similar to the code we used, which is not a sentence that you ever want to find yourself saying. You know, so the key our key goal here is reproducible research, um, by which I mean that the, the, the data and code are organized in a way that you could hand them to someone else and they could rerun the code and get the same results, the same figures and tables. This reproducible is, is not this, I mean, could be dis, should be distinguished from what you might call replicable of um, imagine rerunning the experiment and getting completely new data, analyzing that, will you get the same answer? Um, reproducible is really kind of a minimal standard for co our computational work. Same data, same code, you get the same results. Replicable of if redo the experiment, get new data, do you still come to the same conclusions? That is a more stringent um, expectation. Some authors say, use these two terms exactly in the opposite way from what I'm saying here, but um, the concepts are the key thing. I'm, I'm focusing on kind of the minimal thing, calling reproducible that the same data, the same code gives the same results. Can you do it again? Um, and reproducible is not the same as correct. Um, because it, you, if there's a bug in your code, you run it again, you'll get exactly the same answer, but it'll be the same wrong answer. You, you, know, you hope that if the work is reproducible, that is maybe more likely to be correct. Or if, if you share the code and data with other people, then um, mistakes that you might have made will be more quickly identified. You know, like the the example I started out with where I was using the, an old version of the data set. Um, but there's no, um, there's no guarantee that it's correct. And, um, and this is really kind of a minimal ex requirement for our computational work that you know, the data and code are assembled in a way you can hand them to someone else and they'll get this, if they can rerun it and get the same answers. So the kind of the path from what you know my what had been kind of standard practice in statistics of just focus on getting the right answer and don't re really worry about keeping things organized and having a fully reproducible workflow um, was difficult. It was hard to change all the habits that I had to make my work more reproducible. And in thinking about that, I made this website, um, Steps to Reproducible Research, and it's really those steps that I'm talking about today. A little bit extra added in, but if you, if you want to see a version of this written down rather than spoken, um, most of the ideas are presented there. And, and before I go further, I really want to emphasize that I've... I feel strongly that a little bit reproducible is better than not at all reproducible. And you know, just like a little bit open is, is better than not open. You know, sharing some of the data is better than not sharing any of the data at all. Having the work be close to be reproducible is better than have it you know, completely not reproducible. And 
really you just want to strive to have each project you're working on be a little bit better organized than the last one. It'll always be the case that you get to the end of the project and um, it, it'll be, everything will be a little bit messier and more confusing and not as well documented as you'd like it to be. But if, if you've improved on what you were doing a year ago, then I think you should, you should be happy with that. Just try to make each project a little bit better than the last one you had. Or, you know, as I discuss steps you can take to make your work more reproducible, um, you know, don't try to change everything about your workflow all at once. Just focus on changing one thing at a time. Sort of the first step in trying to make your work more reproducible is to organize your project. Jenny Bryan, a statistician at a statistician in Vancouver, she, she wrote that file organization and naming are powerful weapons against chaos. Um, so related concept is that your closest collaborator is you six months ago, but you don't reply to emails. Um, you, just, you come back to a project six months later, the only messages you have for yourself are the ones that you left there. Um, how, you know, what have you done with a project that allows you to six months later have, be able to make sense of where you were and what all this stuff is? And kind of a, you know, corollary is you know, have sympathy for your future self. So that the way that I, I tend to, I mean, so, I mean, the first step in organizing a project is basically to have all the files related to that project in one place, to have, to not have data over here and code over here and results over there, but a single file for a project that contains everything related to that project, data, code, um, results, analyses. The, my, and my approach is basically to have each project I work on be um, organized in a very hierarchical and, and I basically identical way. And kind of the key concepts are to, to have to separate have separate folders for the in the project for the data and for code. And I also tend to separate raw data files, sort of the primary data files that I get from my collaborator from any derived data files, cleaned versions of the data files that, that I created. Keep those things separate so then it's clear from where a file is sitting of the nature of that file. And keep the, the data separate from the code. Um, and I, I will sometimes have, you know, code in different languages, and I like to put them in different, um, put them in 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 different subdirectories. May have a different subdirectory that has kind of the main some main analysis files, a different directory for figures, um, a subdirectory with notes to myself, maybe um, copies of emails I got from my collaborator. And a, and a directory that has um, references, you know, PDFs of papers related to the work. I will have an overall README file that describes the project and where everything is. And I will often have README files within each of these individual directories that describe their contents, describe, say, what all the different primary data files are in that raw data directory. I might have a to do list and then. I'll have a make file. This is a file that I use for, for automating my analyses, which we'll come back to later. So the, the key principle is for me to have every project directory look the same, everything where I expect it to be. The project directory contains everything related to the project. And I keep separate the data from the code, the raw data from any derived or cleaned process data. Um, and try to have things um, organized in a way that it's clear when you open the project what everything is, where everything goes. You know, th this is, uh, you know, as, a, as opposed to, um, this is a project directory on my hard drive, which I would call an instance of chaos. Just, you know, several dozen, um, poorly named 
subdirectories um, that kind of um, raise my blood pressure. You know, you have subdirectories ping, ping two, ping three, ping four. You know, what could those be? What, why, you know, what is ping two versus ping three? I mean, I happen to remember that ping was a student that worked on the project, but um, what ping two and ping three are, we can't know without um, going in there and looking. This is a, a common difficulty I have of, you know, many side projects to a, in a big project. Um, but I think this is maybe not the way to organize those, those um, multiple side projects. And choosing good names for things is really a, a central, um, well, yeah, as, as Jenny Bryan had said, project organization and naming. Um, choosing good names of things really makes a big difference. Th these are a whole bunch of R scripts related to analysis for a paper. Um, if, if you know what the paper is, they maybe would, I mean, they would be meaningful to you, but they're named somewhat at random, kind of, you, you would have to really look through each, each file one at a time to figure out what it, what, you know, what those files are. Um, you know, you, these are the figures, the, the names of the figures for that paper. Um, you know, figure 10 being stuck between figures one and two is always kind of a pain. If, if you have the paper right next to you, then you, you know, it's clear figure two is figure two in the paper. But it'd be kind of nice if we said figure two underscore and then, you know, some short description. So you wouldn't have to look at the paper to figure out which figure are we looking for, that it would have some description of the contents and not just you know, this sort of generic figure number. Um, so kind of key principles in, or, you know, strategies for choosing good names for things. And I, I must admit, I'm not particularly good at it, um, but include having the names be machine readable. So no spaces in file names, no special characters except underscores and hyphens. Um, but have the names also be human readable, that the names explain the contents. So you don't have to open the file to know what it is. The name of the file explains what, what it contains. To have the names be consistent, um, you know, to have some system for putting names on things, and really to make use of the way that the computer sorts the files by their names. Um, and that means, you know, padding numbers with zeros, you know, figure zero one, figure zero two, um, that will ensure that 10 comes after zero nine rather than between one and two. Um, and and it, if, you, if you name things, say, with, with chunks, you know, words separated by underscores and the initial words give some general grouping and then the, they gradually become more specific then when the, the computer sorts it, it will sort by that general grouping and then sort by more specific groupings. And, you know, and dates, it, many times it's useful to have the file start with the date on which it was contained, created. Um, dates should always be written like this, four digits for the year, two digits for the month, two digits for the day, written in that way. If you write them in that way, then, then files um, that start with dates, they get sorted by the date. Um, you, you can't really talk about um, dates in this date format without pointing to this XKCD comic, but just really there's a, a stand, this is the standard date format and we should all be using that date format all the time and no other date format ever. One, I mean, one approach I've taken for, for naming the scripts in a project or for a paper are to, um, to put num you know, numbers at the beginning of the, the, the script name so that when I, when I sort the scripts, they get sorted by the order in which they should be run. So that the, the names tell you, run this one before this one and before this. And 
you know, in this particular case, I, um, there are a couple groups where it doesn't matter which one you write, which one gets run before the other because they don't depend on each other's results. But so those I use the same number, but it just, it sorts them in a way that, um, that, that tells you in what order these scripts get run. So when I open that directory and I look at the list of files, I know exactly how these scripts, uh, what order they should be run in. And another key principle in naming things is never include final in file names. It, um, I think we've all been in this situation where um, working, you put final in a file name, you, but it, it's immediately revised and it gets more and more revised as time goes on. Um, it, nothing is really ever final. It, it, this is a, the sort of final data set um, directory for that project, the chaotic project I showed before. Um, and just to point out that I have final all over here and all kinds of file names, but because of that, I also have final old um, because it got updated and um, you know, final revision two, revision two because there was, you know, it was revised twice, you know, revision wasn't enough even. Um, it's better to just put version one, version two, version three, ver up to whatever, never put final in a file name because nothing will ever, will ever really be final. For, for this set of files, I think if I were to rename them, I would rename them like this, um, you know, where the, you know, a term at the beginning groups the groups the data files into the, the clinical phenotypes and the gene expression phenotypes. And maybe these were two color gene expression microarrays. So here we have um, the, the, the first intensity on the array and the second intensity on the array and then the ratios of the two. Um, you, you could also have, I could also, here we have, ex, gene expression arrays for various different tissues. I might've put the tissue here and have all the files related to adipose grouped together. Um, the, but the key is to have a system and stick to it and it, in a way that the file names are clear and they explain the contents and they don't complain, contain spaces or other special characters. Um, and don't put final in the file name, use version one, two, three, four, whatever's needed. Yeah, and, you know, finally on the relationship, you know, so organizing the data files, naming the data files and the, and the subdirectories well, and then also documenting the work. Um, and the, the key strategy I use is to have a readme file in you know for the project that explains what all that stuff is and what the process was and then readme files in um, the you know the key subdirectories that explain what all the data files are what all the scripts are doing and and a critical thing here is ensuring that those readme files the documentation actually matches the contents of the project directory when you go and add a new script or add a new data file do you update the documentation so that it matches or you know really nothing worse than having documentation that that um, is documenting the state of the of the project 6 months ago rather than the current state While I have your attention, I want to also talk briefly about how to organize data in spreadsheets. Um, many of my collaborators store their data in spreadsheets. It, I, you know, spreadsheets are great for entering, organizing data. But often um, the data sets that I get are organized in a way that's more like how you would look at them in a, in a you know, how you would organize data in a table, in a paper rather than what might be most useful for me to analyze. So um, this particular data um, are some um, in, in vitro assays, I think, that were done at either one minute or five minute um, treatments. 
and with cells from either the B6 strain of mice or BTBR strain of mice. And um, those mice were either normal at a particular gene or they had a mutation at a particular gene. So me knowing this data, I know what all these numbers are. I know really th that the, the values are in triplicate, that these three numbers here correspond to the B6 mouse strain normal cells. The, uh, you know, these three numbers here correspond to the B6 mouse um, with this mutation. But telling this to a computer is difficult. You know, even if I, if I just want to plot these data or take the average within each treatment group, it's difficult to par it's difficult to, to get the computer to parse out which values go with which. Better would be to organize these such that each response really, each row in the data file is one, is one response value, one mouse measurement. Um, and the columns are the different variables. What treatment was used? What strain is the mouse from? And this, the state of this mutation, normal or mutant. Organized in this way, it will be, I, I can jump immediately into the analysis and really the, um, and that, this is the ideal way to have your data organized. Um, I wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago, um, kind of that key principles articulated in that paper are that the data should be a, a rectangle with the individual measurements as rows and the variables as columns have just a single header row, not, not multiple header rows and, and just one item in every cell. Um, don't put the, the number and units, don't put um, the number and some note about, about it. If um, one item per cell. I also prefer to have no empty cells. You know, if there's missing data that you, you rather than leave the cell completely blank, that you put some missing value code like NA um, or a hyphen. The, there should be no calculations in the raw data. You should have a raw data file that has no calculations in it. And if you wanna use the spreadsheet to do calculations, you make a copy of the data file and you do the calculations in the copy of the data file. There are no graphs in a raw data file. And that's really that you should, you should um, you know, create the raw data file and then lock it down and not change it. You shouldn't be opening it up to look at the results or to make different graphs. The, the raw data file, primary data file should be just locked down and not changed except to add or, or fix problems in the data. And don't include highlighting or coloring or font style as data itself. Um, you can use that, but it, it, it should, the information of, you know, sort of, if you highlight cells to indicate that there's a problem, um, th that information about the highlighting is hard to extract from, from the, the, the spreadsheet. It's better to have a separate column that's sort of pointing out which data points are problematic. And you know, another thing to emphasize is that the naming of things in your data files are important too. Um, I once was working with data where one of the columns was FAD, NAD, SI, 8.3, 3.3 G, um, which is hard to work with because of the spaces, but also it just, um, it, it's not at all clear what this means. So having, having names of variables that are, that are evocative or at least or including metadata that describes the data, a data dictionary that explains what each variable is can be really helpful. Um, really critical for the for the data analyst of, of being connect feeling any connection to the data rather than them just being columns and numbers. To create a data dictionary that explains what each column is and maybe includes different versions of the variable names, you know, compact versus descriptive. Um, could include the units and what are the expected or allowable values in, in the different columns. And I recommend, you know, the, these, these metadata are themselves data. And so ideally they're organized 
you know, as a rectangle, um, rather than rather than putting this information, say, in a Word document, um, it'd be great if it were in another spreadsheet that you know, as a rectangle where each row is one variable in the primary data file, and each column is a different aspect of this data dictionary that, you know, the, the name, a different version of the name, a description, units, allowable values, that kind of thing. So he, here's an example of a kind of data dictionary I have in mind. Um, so each row is one of the variables in another data set. Um, and the the, the first column are the, the column names in that other data set. Second column are um, the, the second column are the, the names that you might show in a graph of these data. The third column groups those variables, you know, demographic, clinical phenotypes, et cetera, and then a, a description of each variable. So that, I mean that was. Um, a long-winded first step towards making things re reproducible. That um, the, you know, the first step in making your work reproducible is organize your data and code, it, encapsulated in one subdirectory, um, organized and meaningfully named with you know and documented to explain what things are and where they are. The the second step that I would encourage you toward is everything that you do with the data that you do with the script. Um, there, there are two main reasons for this. One is, is if, you know, if, if you find yourself opening up the data, a data file and, and saving it as common delimited or opening up a data file and doing some edits to some of the column names to make them easier to work with. If you do that once, you're gonna end up doing it a thousand times. You, your collaborator will send you. Your collaborator will send you a new version of this data, and you'll have to all the hand editing that you did to the first data file. You'll be doing on the second data file. Um, much better is anything that you might do to the data that you do with code that you handle in your code. A second reason for this is that then, really, everything that you do to the data is documented in that code. Um, the code itself contains the explanation of what it is that you did. This can be really challenging. The, I mean, many of the things that, that you'd like to do by hand because they're just hard, they require um, writing scripts that are complicated and you know, use your most, um, your, your, your greatest coding skills. But this is a, a goal to strive for. So kind of an example of the sort of things that you might wanna to try to do um, are you know, small corrections that you have to make to the data. So in this particular data file, um, these four cells for right adipose weight um, were in the wrong units. I think most of the most of the values were in milligrams and these, um, these four data points were in grams. So, you know, I could go in and hand edit those, but it'd be much better to, to deal with that kind of mistake in the data um, in, in code rather than um, hand edit the file. You know, even better is probably to have your collaborator go back and fix it in the primary data file and send you a version that doesn't have the error. But these sort of things you, you are inclined to do by hand, but it'd be better to do it with code. Another example um, are you know having different column names between different batches of data. You know you get a second set of mice, second I mean a second set of subjects, um, and the the file for them the column names are somewhat different. You might be tempted to go in and edit the the files to make the column names the same. Um, so, you know, so that you can merge them, but you just, if you hand edit these files, you're going to be doing hand editing of the files repeatedly. And it, um, better is to have your code be able to handle the difference between these file names. You know, in this case, a third batch of data set, third batch of data, the files were, um, the columns were, 
the columns were the same as in the second batch of data, but they were in a different order from the, from the second batch, which is um, another thing you need to work, look out for. You know, don't assume that each batch of data has the columns in the same order, because um, you know, anything can happen. You really want to verify that that's true. One, one solution to this sort of problem of um, getting different batches of data, having column names change, is, is to have metadata that explains, um, you, know, you know, for each batch of data, which file do I look at and which column do I look at? Kind of in an in extreme case of this, um, different files, they had different subject ID columns. The, the subject ID was named different things. It was named mouse in a couple files and ID in some other files. And there were some, there were some cases where um, figuring out which columns to combine with each other required, you look for the column with this name and then go over two to the right, that kind of thing. So I had this column offset. Um, this has been one approach I've taken when I have a complicated set of multiple batches of data with files with sub somewhat different formats is to have metadata that says which files are in which formats. And then, then this combined with the data set, then I can have just scripts that, that do the analysis. Um, I don't need to hand edit any files. And really a, a key principle for me, you know, is if a collaborator asks, in what form would you like the data? The answer is always in its present form. That it, you know, I may not be happy with the organization of the data file that I get from a collaborator. I may prefer it to be reorganized in some way, but it's almost always the case that I'm the, you know, the data analyst is in the best position to do any reorganization of the data that, you know, we might talk about how future data sets might be organized differently, but with the current data set, I'm in a better position to reorganize it than my collaborator usually is. Because you, you don't want to um, have your collaborator go back and hand edit files to put them in a better organization. Um, best to take them as they are and use code to reorganize them into a way that's convenient for the analysis. So those, those two steps towards reproducibility are you know, really big steps. Organizing your code and data encapsulated in one subdirectory and named in a way that's meaningful and um, documented. And everything that you're doing with the data you know, in scripts, encoded in scripts in that subdirectory, then that's reproducible. You hand that to someone else and they can, in principle, um, read your documentation and figure out how to run the code. All the code's there. Um, it'll be reproducible. So, um, the, but the, the next step that I would recommend taking is um, to in, really, instead of writing scripts, to write reproducible reports. Um, the, the idea is, you know, so this is an example of a document I wrote for data diagnostics for a project. Um, you know, this is the first few paragraphs that describe, um, you know, how many markers there are, how many mice were genotyped and phenotyped for this project, and such like. The key thing here is that, you know, behind this document, this is um, a a you know source document that has a mixture of code and data and text, and when um, sort of behind the scenes, there's there's a document that has the text of the report with bits of code mixed into it, um, bits of R code that when this document is um, compiled, the the bits of R code get run and replaced with the uh, with the result. And so um, in the report that I give to my collaborator, it has numbers like this, you know, 36,000 markers and 
you know, 1500 mice. And those numbers are coming straight from the data. Um, so the, the, this is the sort of um, report that I give to my collaborators. This um, using R Markdown, it's a mixture of Markdown is sort of the text format and R that's the code that I'm using. Um, makes it so that when I, the report that I give to a collaborator, the, all the numbers in there are coming straight from the data and I know they're reproducible, they're correct. Well, they're correct except for whatever bugs I have in my report, in my code. Um, but I'm moving towards having really all the work that I do related to a project be in reports like this rather than in a script that um, data cleaning and, and processing I do rather than have a script that does the data cleaning. I have a report that, like this that does the data cleaning itself, but also contains the, um, you know, what I was looking at and what decisions I was making and why I chose to make certain decisions. Like in a report like this, I decide these six individuals should be omitted from the analysis because there's something wrong with those samples. Um, and I, I show, I not only do the omission of those samples, but I also show why I chose to omit those two, those samples. So moving towards, moving from writing scripts that do data cleaning to writing proper reproducible reports that, that capture not the what you did, but also why you chose to do it um, will make you happier later on. It's kind of the fourth main step to that I take in making my, my work more reproducible is to automate the process. And the, the main tool I use is, is this um, command line tool, GNU Make. It's a very old tool. It's almost as old as I am. Um, it was originally written for compiling large computer programs, you know, old Fortran code that the Fortran code needed to be compiled to object code and then multiple object codes linked together to make an executable program. Um, it, it was written to do things like that. But basically make can be used to automate any process that you run at the command line. And the, the way it works is you have this file that describes what, um, which, fi which files are you gonna create? So they, comes in these little batches of batches of lines that on the on the left here is the the a target file that I need to create a, you know an HTML file this is the the web page that's the report I'm going to give to my collaborator and then what are the files that that depends on that web page depends on the source R markdown document the you know the reproduce the the mixture of code and text that I write myself and a clean version of the data. And then below that is a line of code that says, if you run this code and it turns the, the, the source documents into that, that target document. And below here I have, you know, that that clean version of the data is dependent on some um, prepared data script and a raw data file. And that raw data file is dependent on um, the original raw Excel file and some Python script that turns an Excel file to a CSV file. Um, so the, the key thing is that this, with this make tool is that it fully automates the process. If I plug in a different raw data file, um, I run one command, this one make command, and it sees that it needs, I plug in a new Excel raw data file. It sees it needs to convert that to a CSV file run this prep data to make a clean fa data file and then um, you know, use it in this analysis report to, to produce the web page that I send to my collaborator. Um, it, there, there are a variety of newer tools for this. Um, for, you know, for Python, people use SnakeMake. For Ruby, people use Rake. For um, for R, there's a, there's a package called Drake. Um, different ways of automating um, complex processes like this that um, the, the advantage of make, you know, make is a bit quirky, 
uh, you know, at each of these lines, it needs to start with a tab character. It can't be just a bunch of spaces. If I have, and it has to be a tab character. And it, if for a command, I need to change into a subdirectory and then run it, I have to do that all on one line. If I did change into the R subdirectory and then do this on two separate lines, it, would, it wouldn't work. Um, but make is readily avail. It's available on most systems or, or easily installed in most systems. You, um, it's, and I, so that's why I still use it, but there, there are mo more modern options. The, the next main step to take in making your work more reproducible is really to look at the code and try to improve the code itself. And the main way to improve your code is to write modular code. Modular code is easier to understand, easier to maintain, easier to use, reuse. And the kind of the, per, the main thing that I recommend is to turn any repeated code that you've written into functions. You know, the most common thing for me is that, you know, in a, you know, a data analysis, I have some chunk of code that's making a graph and I want to make a related graph so I, with, you know, a, you know, for a different gene. So I, I copy the code and paste it and then edit the code. And then I'll do that a third time, maybe. Um, the problem is if, if I decide I want to change something about the nature of those, those figures, like, you know, just what colors I use, my collaborator doesn't like the, my color choices. I would have to go and, and edit each of those different code chunks. If instead I had at the very, you know, first step, um, pulled out that code into a function and then had three different function calls, um, for my three different versions of my graph. If I'd wanted to change something about the color choices, I just change that one instance in that function. I don't have to change the other three. Um, easier to maintain, easier to, um, to, to modify. But also, I mean, the other thing is that in the, you know, my report document, instead of having three big chunks of code that make the figures, I just have sort of a one line function call. So it's easier to follow what's going on. There's this one function that's making this figure. I don't have to page past a whole bunch of code. The, the second main way to make code modular is to combine any, the functions you've made into a package or module. You know, in, um, in our package, a Python module, a Python package, um, the, the set of functions that you've made for a project, if you were to combine those together and make them into a package that was accessible from other projects, um, you would then be more likely to reuse them. And you wouldn't, you know, as I sometimes find myself be having to think back to, you know, you get to a new project and you're like, I made a figure that would be really useful here. You know, let me hunt through my past projects to find where I had done that before. Um, if I had separated that out as a package separate from the individual projects, um, it'd be much more um, straightforward to reuse those things and to find them. You know, another key issue in this process is keeping track of versions of things. It's maybe not directly related to reproducibility, but it's um, closely tied to it. We, we all have to keep track of versions of, of things. Um, you think back to that cartoon with the final in the, in the um, manuscript name. Um, you know, various different strategies for keeping track of versions. One is to you know, put them in some Google Drive or Dropbox or Box folder and you know, sort of let that system keep track of past versions that maybe you can roll back to a version that you, that, um, you had previously if you want to. Another approach is to, is to make copies of files and put version numbers in those file names and just have, you know, zip all the files for a project together into a, a zip file with a version number and then just keep a variety of different versions of that project. Um, sort of 
more challenging in the short term, but better in the long term is to use a former version, a formal version control system like Git and um, the, the website GitHub. The, the formal version co control um, has the advantage that it allows you to browse through the changes more easily. It allows you to try out new things without fear of breaking stuff that's working. It makes it easy to, easier to, to jump to the state of a project at any given time point. If, you, you know, if, if a script had been working and it's no longer working, you can, you can jump back in time and figure out you know, what had changed over, you know, where was it that it went from working to not working? Um, and really that a big sell for formal version control like Git is, is merging simultaneous changes from multiple people. If, if multiple people are working on, you know, code for a project at the same time um, and they need to be merged together, Git is really amazing at doing that. So um, just as an example, this is a Git repository, a version control repository for a talk of mine, um, the, the, the slides for a talk written in LaTeX. The, I mean, the key thing is to think about version control is you have, you have a, a directory um, for all the files related to the, you know, the slides for this talk. And the, the version control system is keeping track of all, you know, that directory of files, all the files in that directory and any subdirectory and, and the files contained in subdirectories. Um, but it, it's, it's tell, it, it knows not just about the current state of those files, but it knows the history of, of each of those files going back. That, um, that subdirectory of, that directory of files has this history of changes that, it, that have occurred over time. Really a key thing is that anytime I make a change, I need to kind of register. I've made these changes to the files and I wanna keep them. And then I write a little note to myself. So e um, each of these is called a commit. I've committed some set of changes to the files in the project. And I write this note to my future self to say what it was that I changed. But then for each of these commits, each change that I made, I can look and see exactly what the changes were. Um, you know, in this particular file, I deleted two lines and added in four lines. And really, it's that for this particular um, for this for this particular function, I had to add a special case for when k is equal to zero. Um, and then in one of the slides, I had to change a one, two to a two, three. So version control, um, as you change things, you keep track of, you know, you kind of tell the system, these changes I wanna keep. And you write this little note to your future self to say what the changes were. Um, but then you can go back and look at what all the changes were. You can jump to any, any state and time. You can compare the files at any two time points to see what has been changed. Um, I get this is a, a blow up of, of that bit, just if you wanted to see it bigger. Um, I, I want to emphasize here, it, not at all really related to anything, but backups are really critical. I, it maybe doesn't have to do with reproducibility, but it just has to do with us being good um, stewards of our computational work that you should, you should make sure that your work is backed up multiple places, including offsite. Um, this is especially important when we're all like working from home on our laptops. You know, are, is the work, you know, the work on your dissertation sitting on your laptop, is it backed up anywhere? Is it backed up anywhere outside of your house? If your house were on fire or there was a flood, you know, a broken pipe and your laptop was destroyed, would you lose everything or would you have a copy? And a really important principle is that these backups need to be automatic. If you have to go and like plug in a hard drive into your laptop, you know, in order for it to be backed up, I um, 
just will guarantee to you that it won't be backed up nearly as often as you think, near, nearly as often as it should be. And when catastrophe occurs, the backup that you, that you have will be older than you really wish. Um, you you want to make sure that backups are happening automatically offsite. Um, the work that you're doing is you're doing, you know, on a server in your department back at the university and, um, you know, professionals are taking care of making sure that it's backed up well, or you are enrolled in some kind of cloud service for backups that are backing up your work um, outside of your laptop sitting at your house. And a final point is really about licensing your software. So, you know, for our work to, you know, our goal was for our work to be reproducible, that the data and code for a project are assembled in a way, organized in a way that you could hand them to someone else and they can rerun the code and get the same results, you know, the same figures and tables. The thing is, is that um, you, you hand your code to someone else, you put it out there for people to use in, in because of the way copyright law works in the United States, they can't actually um, run the code unless you explicitly give them permission to. And that's what software licenses do. And I've, Jeff Atwood has a blog post about this, pick a license, any license. You know, there are lots of different software licenses. Just um, if you want other people to be able to run your code, pick a license and make it clear. Um, software licenses really do generally do two things. They say, feel free to run the code. You're all are, you know, use this code, whatever way you want, or use this code in explicitly these ways. That's what the software license does. It's part one. Part two is really to um, keep your, keep you from being sued. Uh, most of these software licenses will say something like, but I'd, I don't guarantee that it will work and it won't make your computer explode. And so don't sue me if something terrible happens. And that's because in, you know, sort of the law differs by states, but, but in some states, software is treated like a good, like a car. And so if, if someone uses your software and makes a clinical decision that ends up being bad, they can come back and sue you. And the software licenses, um, so have usually have a clause that says, don't sue me. This is license your software to let people know explicitly that they're able to use it and that they shouldn't sue you if something goes wrong. Now, I guess, it, so a final point, you know, the actual sharing there, you know, there's a variety of different ways you can share both the data and the code. Code um, GitHub is repository of Git repositories is really maybe the best way to share code. That's what people go to look for. Bitbucket is a, a similar um, site that you can also use. Zenodo is a website that is um, kind of makes ar archival versions of snapshots of repositories at GitHub or other things, and will give you a you know a, a digital a you know, a document identifier, um, you know, just like you get for a paper. So that, I mean, that's, that's what I would recommend is, you know, put your code on GitHub and maybe, you know, sort of the key version of it, um, have a snapshot, go to Zenodo. Data, I would, I guess, start with, if there's a domain specific repository for your kind of data, like dbGaP for, for um, GWAS, human GWAS data, then put the data there at that um, kind of website. Uh, next, move to some kind of general repository. You know, for small data sets, you could also put them on GitHub or Figshare, Zenodo, um, Data Dryad. Those are all um, nice places that you can put, you know, larger um, sort of your primary data set for people to um, get that will be able to stick around. I think finally, um, would be to look at an institutional repository of, it, you know, UW-Madison has a, um, 
would be um, able to store your data and make it available to people in a way that would, would outlive you and your project. But so in summary, in trying to make our work more reproducible, we start with organizing the project, choosing good names for things, and documenting what's there. Like those three things are you know, huge in when you hand it to somebody else that it'll make sense and they'll be able to figure out what to do with it. I would also recommend organizing the data itself, organizing it as a rectangle, um, including metadata that describe the data. And that data is data, that metadata is data. So it should also be organized as a rectangle or would, I would prefer it to be. Um, everything that you do with data to be in a script is sort of challenging, but a good, you know, a laudable long-term goal. Even better is to just use these reproducible reports just even better is to have no scripts, but to have reports that include both code and um, description and results that show not just what you did, but why you chose to do it. Um, and next is automating the process. I use this old tool, Make. Um, th then to look at the code itself and try to make it better. And the key way to do that is to make it more modular. Um, to break up repeated code into functions and to assemble those functions into packages. To use version control. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with Git, it will be painful for three months, but long-term it will make your life better. License your software so that when you distribute it, people can and will use it and share your data and code. A whole bunch of things that I didn't talk about, you know, software testing to make sure you're getting the right answers, software versions, really capturing the whole environment of the, your analysis, um, how to make large scale computations reproducible, including um, computer simulations, which are notoriously difficult to reproduce, um, and collaborations when, you know, when it's more than just you doing the work, how to coordinate, who does what, and where, and where things will sit. And that is an, an important challenge. Um, I, I wanna end with a, a point from Keith Baggerly that, that the, the most important tool is the mindset when starting that the end product be reproducible. That it is sort of the key tool for re the most important of all our tools for reproducible research is that when you sit down at the work, you are focused on making it reproducible, that that's your goal. Now, I would add that kind of the second most important tool is training. You know, all these different tools that I've mentioned, um, they take a while to, to know and really the, you know, learning those things is, is really so that they can be part of your regular Workflow is really important. The, the slides for this presentation are online. Um, you can find my website, um, everything. Uh, you can find on my website, like basically slides for every talk I've given in the past, what, yeah, 25 years. Um, here's my site on GitHub and you can also find me on Twitter.